Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending our webinar. My name is Rebecca Hart, and I'm the Marketing Manager and Account Manager at NanoComposites. Uh, today, we're very excited to host our longtime collaborators from the University of Minnesota, uh, Dr. John Bischoff and Dr. Kanav uh, Kolska. Uh, they are leading experts in cryo cryopreservation and nano warming technology. Uh, the work Dr. Bischoff and his team um, at, Uni at University of Minnesota are doing currently is truly exceptional. And they're working on groundbreaking technology in cryopreserve the cryopreservation of tissue and cell models for critical research. I also have Dr. Aaron Saunders, our chief scientist and all around nanotechnology expert at nanocomposites, as well as Sage Olson, our digital communications coordinator, who is running our technical support in the background. Uh, during the webinar, you may ask us any questions you have by using the Q&A feature. If you don't already have the, the Q&A panel popped up on your screen, please look uh, for the Q&A button at the bottom portion of your Zoom window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of today's presentation. Um, as for nanocomposites, uh, we are currently partnering with University of Minnesota by supplying materials for their research and development. If you're unfamiliar with nanocomposites, for over 15 years, we've been providing customers with nanoparticles that are precisely engineered and highly characterized. Some of the attributes that are vital for work such as this. Additionally, our diverse team of scientists work hand in hand with academia and businesses to help integrate nanotechnology into their solutions. One of those scientists, Dr. Saunders, today will start us off by providing a brief introduction on our nanoparticles and describe how photothermal properties of this material play a large role in nano warming research underway at University of Minnesota. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Saunders. Thanks for the introduction, Rebecca. To start with today, I'd like to give you a quick overview of some of the nanomaterials and nanomaterial properties that are useful for designing photothermal therapies and other applications. At Nanocomposics, we use a wide variety of nanoparticles and molecular and biomolecule building blocks to help develop and enable new technologies. Today, we'll focus primarily on the use of gold and silver particles of different sizes and shapes. The reason for that is that these materials, among others, have unique optical properties that depend on their size, shape, and environment. The bottom left image shows uh, transmission electron microscope images of different sizes of gold spheres. Solutions of those colloidal gold particles of different sizes are shown at the top left. And you can see how the visible appearance changes with size. We can quantify the, the change in size of the solution extinction by measuring the uh, solution extinction by UV visible spectroscopy. And the optical density as a function of wavelength is shown at the right. Here you see a peak that shifts with particle size due to a surface plasmon resonance a response that's unique to particles in this nanoscale size range. These unique optical properties arise due to the collective movement of free electrons in the metal particles in response to applied light waves. Previously, we saw that the wavelength where this plasma resonance occurs for gold nanospheres is in the green portion of the spectrum. But by controlling the particle composition and morphology, the wavelength where this resonance occurs can be tuned across the spectrum. One of the benefits of the colloidal synthesis routes that we use at nanocomposites is that by controlling the chemistry during the synthesis, we can tune the size and shape of different materials in order to tune their properties. And here you see some examples of shape control using different gold and silver based materials. By controlling that particle size and shape, instead of having just a red appearing solution, we can shift that optical response to different portions of the spectrum, giving rise to the very vividly colored solutions that you see here. And then looking at different classes of these gold and silver particles, you can see how by tuning the size and shape and aspect ratio of these materials, we can tune that resonance across the visible spectrum and throughout the near infrared for use in different applications. 
One of the other unique properties of these nanoparticles, in addition to be able, in addition to being able to tune where that resonance occurs, is that their optical response can involve both the scattering and absorption of light. And that can take part in different portions of the spectrum. Shown here is a glass cup dating from the Roman times that has, that has gold nanoparticles embedded into the glass. And these are two different images of the same cup, which you see on the left-hand side, if you shine white light directly onto the front of the cup, is that it selectively reflects green light back to us. If you shine light through the cup, as you see on the right-hand side, here the particles in the glass either absorb or scatter the blue and the green light and only selectively transmit red light through the glass. The balance between this absorption and scattering depends on all of those factors that we mentioned earlier and selecting a material with a particular split between absorption and scattering is important in a variety of technologies, including photothermal applications. And in order to understand that scattering and absorption split, we use a variety of techniques ranging from modeling to more complicated optical measurements in order to selectively measure either the scattering response or that absorption response. That absorption in particular is critical for photothermal heating and the absorption of light and that transfer to heat is a key aspect of the different particles that we use. This transfer occurs when light excites the electrons in our nanoparticle. Those electrons um, from their excited state, they can transfer that energy to the atoms in the particle, causing them to vibrate and heat up. And then that heat from the particles can be transferred to the surrounding environment. And when it does so, depending on our use, we can selectively damage surrounding cells, produce a heat signature for detection, drive different types of reactions using that heat, or depending on the particle design, it could release a molecular cargo for a particular application. We can measure and quantify this photothermal response for different materials in a variety of ways. One way is by shining laser light on the solution of nanoparticles. We can measure the energy that's delivered from the laser. We can measure the energy that's absorbed by the particles. And then we can measure the temperature change in the solution as a function of time as the nanoparticles heat their surrounding. And if we do so, we see temperature profiles that look like what's shown on the left. Whereas we apply laser light to the material, we see a gradual heating of the solution. And then as we turn off the laser at a set time point, we see the heat uh, further dissipated to the surroundings and the overall solution temperature drops. Go back. And I'll say that we can use this measured temperature change along with our understanding of the particle optical properties in order to understand uh, how we would choose a particle for a particular photothermal mm -hmm. application and to understand how its efficiency compares across different materials or types of materials. There are a number of photothermal based applications that are at different stages in development. Some of the early applications in this area using nanoparticles were dermatology related, using nanoparticle formulations for hair removal or in acne treatments, for example. And there are several examples of products that have gone through clinical trials and been used commercially in clinical settings. Uh, there are a number of other in vivo treatments or applications using nanoparticles for photothermal cancer treatments or therapeutics, for example, um, that are moving through clinical trials and at various points in the regulatory process. And for these materials, in addition to their optical properties, it's critical that the particles are also designed to ensure biocompatibility and to make sure that both the particles and the surface chemistry is tuned and non-toxic to people or uh, other environments where they're being used. And as part of that, those nanoparticles need to be manufactured in a way that meets all the regulatory requirements that the FDA or other bodies would require for their use. In addition, there are a wide variety of other photothermal enabled applications ranging from diagnostics to tissue preservation 
that are now in development. And on that note, I'm very happy to now hand the presentation over to our collaborators at the University of Minnesota to talk more about these applications and their exciting work about using these nanoparticles to develop new technologies. So uh, I wanted to thank Nano Composites and uh, Dr. Saunders and uh, also Rebecca for inviting us to present some of the work that we've been doing at the University of Minnesota in collaboration with uh, a number of other institutions. Uh, I will also uh, thank uh, Dr. Koslo, who's going to uh, share with you some particularly exciting work on aquatic species cryopreservation after I give you a general overview of some of the work that we're doing <clears throat> at the Bioheat and Mass Transfer Lab at the University of Minnesota and also in a new NSF engineering research center called the uh, ATP Bio, which stands for Advanced Technologies for the Preservation of Biological Systems. So the, the ERC is really focused on societal benefits that can be realized through the banking, transportation, and storage of biological systems. So you see uh, initially cell therapies there on the upper left. These are really the drugs of tomorrow. And so if we can bank them and store them with high viability so they can be easily used, they will increase uh, patient access and outcomes. We're also working on transplantable tissues and organs, which can allow the right organ and tissue to get to the right person at the right time in terms of transplantation. We're also working on drug discovery through off the shelf banking of tissues <coughs> and cells. And this will actually shrink the cost of the greater than $2 billion of drug uh, that you can see in biopharma in terms of their development costs. We're also banking transgenic lines and also genetic models. And uh, uh, Kanaf will be talking to you about some of that in, in just a moment. Uh, some of that technology is also being applied to banking whole ecosystems like coral reefs. And actually there's a conversation underway in terms of creating a fauna bank, something like what exists in Norway for seeds, which is called Svalbard. We also uh, can use these technologies towards aquaculture, creating cryo seed. So these are embryos that can be brought out of cryogenic storage at any time of the year instead of just when the uh, fish or the aquatic species might seasonally procreate, and this will increase aquaculture production. We can also bank tissues and biodressing for mass casualty events, such as the volcano eruption in New Zealand. There would be skin available, and perhaps some of those people could have been saved. And also studying trauma, uh, rather st stabilization uh, in torpor that could improve trauma and battlefield injuries. So these are the very big ideas that govern uh, our ERC. And I just want to say this is a <clears throat> the, one of the largest, maybe it's the largest NSF uh, National Science Foundation Center grant. And so this has been a $26 million five-year investment, 33 faculty across five institutions. Uh, it is renewable for another five years. So it's a very big undertaking. So it really focuses on increasing, as I said, uh, storage and banking, and then giving uh, the opportunity for transportation and really increasing, increasing accessibility to these uh, biological systems. And so if we take organs as an example, today we can hypothermic uh, restore them, basically putting them on ice for a couple of hours. And with these new technologies that are coming online, for instance, supercooling at Massachusetts General Hospital, we can extend liver preservation to days now, which is really uh, exciting and may change the way we do organ allocation in the United States and perhaps even the world. And there are newer technologies like partial freezing where we can learn from nature. There's a frog that can survive in the frozen state with 65% of its water actually in the frozen state, Rana sylvatica. And if we can harness some of that potential, then we could do that to organs as well. And that might give us weeks or even months of storage. And then the real uh, focus that you'll hear about in the rest of this talk is trying to get to indefinite storage through a process called vitrification. 
And as an engineer, this is really focused on modification of temperature, pressure, and concentration in these systems to actually get a, a, an organ into a glass-like state instead of a frozen state. And you can see an example of that on the bottom left. And so as we go to these lower temperatures, you can obviously see the storage duration increases. The metabolic suppression also goes, uh, goes up as you, as you drop the temperature. And that is really the goal. So if we could go to the next slide. So the problem that we're addressing, one of the problems that we're addressing is of course, getting to those preserved states. And there are these multiple example technologies that I just talked to you about. But one of the bigger problems that we've had is getting rapid and uniform recovery or warming from the cryogenic state. And that's what we have had this longer term collaboration with nanocomposites on. So we're actually using both magnetic as well as photothermal nanoparticles to rapidly and uniformly rewarm these systems. And that's what you'll, you'll hear about for the rest of this talk and also uh, Kanoff's talk to follow. So we can do this at multiple scales. If you look in the upper left, you can see examples of droplets. These are millimeter scale droplets in which you can have embryos or cells or a variety of systems. If you uh, cool them rapidly enough, they will vitrify. If you can't, they will crystallize. And the same thing exists on the way back up as you're trying to warm. You wanna keep it vitrified until it actually goes into liquid state. Uh, or you will crystallize and, and uh, destroy the sample. That then can be scaled up to the next level in tissues, which you see in the middle, a vitrified versus a crystallized example. Those large white areas of crystals have been destructive to the, uh, to the tissues. And then on the far right, it's the same organ system I just showed you, where you are vitrified or in a glassy state on the far right, and you're frozen, which is essentially destroying the vasculature and the cells on the, on the left. And in order to come back from these successfully vitrified states, if you haven't actually destroyed them on the way down, we need speed to avoid devitrification, which you see in the middle there. And you also need uniformity. So like when you drop an ice cube in a glass of water, it always cracks. And the reason for that is that you're bringing up the temperature very rapidly on the sides, but not in the center. And so uh, we want to distribute the heating throughout the system, and we want the heating to be fast. And so those are the two things to focus on, and we're going to tell you how nanoparticles can help us do that. Next slide, please. So this is an example <clears throat> in a larger system. This was uh, something we published a couple of uh, years ago in Science Translational Medicine and then followed it up with another publication in Advanced Science uh, actually this year. And it's showing magnetic nanoparticles that have been perfused into a whole rat kidney. And you can see the distribution, uh, not an optimal formulation on the far left and a far better formulation uh, one over that's circling in the, in the left upper uh, quadrant. And we basically perfuse in uh, both cryoprotective agents, which are like biological antifreeze molecules, as well as these iron oxide nanoparticles. We can then look at that with both micro CT, which is on the left, or we can look at it with uh, a type of uh, MRI pulse sequencing on the right, and we can actually quantify where the iron is within the organ. And the benefit of this, <clears throat> you can see below, on cooling, you know, we've been able to actually create vitrified kidneys for some time. But if you look at, and that's what you see in A there, if you look at C, convective warming is how people have traditionally done it. And you can see the center and the edge of your container in terms of the thermal behavior, they are quite different. And that is actually what can drive cracks. And that's what you see in, the, in D is basically large temperature variation across the sample. Whereas if you have distributed iron oxide throughout the system, you're able to bring up both the center and the edge together. And so that brings very little thermal gradient in your system and avoids cracks. And it also goes fast enough that we can avoid crystals. Next 
slide, please. So what we're doing now <clears throat> with many collaborators uh, across ATB Bio is we're looking for better formulations, uh, including also with nanocomposites, better formulation of these nanoparticles, how we coat them and how they remain stable in cryoprotective solutions, and also making sure that they continue to heat well despite being in cryoprotective solutions, which you see there on the bottom left. We can also consider new embodiments of nanoparticles like nanowires or cubes or uh, different elliptical uh, or different shapes of magnetic nanoparticles. And all of that increases the magnetic anisotropy that can lead to higher heating. So there's a huge opening area of exploration in these magnetic nanomaterials to make their heating more efficient. And then we're also scaling up so we're building RF coils at the University of Minnesota where we already can do rat and rabbit kidneys, but we're trying to get to whole human kidneys and human liver lobes. And so we have a, a device that's going into installation this spring in, uh, at the University of Minnesota that will get up to human sized organs for this. Next slide, please. Well, this is where I will take over. Um, yes. And thank you, Dr. Bischoff, for the wonderful overview. And thank you all for being here. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about why we use laser-based nanowarming technology. And then I will obviously go into depth about how it's applied to the cryopreservation of all these different systems that we work on. And then our deep collaborative work with uh, nanocomposites on the cryopreservation of zebrafish embryos. But first, why do we need such fast laser warming? As you guys can see here, uh, when we... Uh, for different uh, types of concentrations of cryoprotectants, uh, we have different kinds of cooling, critical cooling rates. And that essentially means for us cryobiologists, you have to essentially cool and rewarm at these specific rates in order to avoid ice crystallization. And for you know, these droplet-based systems that we initially touched on, which is, you know, the, they can be these embryos, the shrimp larvae or coral larvae, they cannot take very high concentrations of cryoprotectants. So we have to work in this regime over here and that makes us work with very fast cooling and warming rates. So there was a pathbreaking study that came out in 2011 that told us cryobiologists essentially is something to focus on is more the warming because on the warming side, you already have nuclei of ice present. And so the, the likelihood of devitrification and cracking exists more on the warming side. And that's also the reason why warming rates have to be much higher. So Dr. Peter Mazur, a world-renowned cryobiologist in this area, started developing a laser-based technique where he showed that you could essentially use one third of the optimal cryoprotectants in MISO sites uh, and are still able to get very high viabilities as long as you use very fast uh, cooling rates uh, and warming rates, sorry, uh, not necessarily the cooling rates. And this is what you kind of see here, you know, the difference between 95 C per minute all the way to 69,000. It's really the viabilities are pretty high as long as the warming rate is fairly high. So we've been able to use laser-based warming uh, specifically because, you know, compared to India Inc., which is what it was used in the original study, these nanoparticles can be easily uh, generated, manufactured, they can be made biocompatible, and we can essentially tune the absorption of those nanoparticles on what kind of wavelength we use. So we've been able to find that uh, it's not necessarily just the absorption of the nanoparticle that generates heat, but it's also about how you spread the heat uniformly. So it's, it's both... Uh, you know, the design parameters have to be, uh, have to be <clears throat> evaluated based on what the ratios of absorption and scattering we have. So as you can see over here from our, our recent study in nanoscale, we were able to show that uh, you need to have an optimal ratio of both scattering and absorbing agents in your droplets in order to achieve uniform warming. And now we're essentially working with different groups at the University of Minnesota and University of California Riverside to help us generate those nanoparticles that can help us do that. So we've been, we're currently working and we have been able to apply this technology to multiple different systems, certain kinds of mammalian systems. Obviously, Dr. Bishop talked about coral larvae. This is our reef restoration project with the Smithsonian down in Hawaii. Uh, aquaculture uh, models such as, you know, Pacific white shrimp, which is 80% of the aquaculture market. And obviously zebrafish, which is a big uh, biomedical model and lots of transgenic lines are created. And there are other systems we also would like to work on. And you'll notice that these are all systems that um, 
are mostly marine systems or systems that are terrestrial, but not essentially looked at as, you know, the models of, you know, biomedical research. But this technology should be able to help us get there. Because what it does is it allows us to rewarm larger volumes, get to a higher throughput, and also allow us the use of less CPU. So you will obviously get higher viability and you can bank these large amounts of uh, gametes from all these different kinds of organisms. So some of the unique challenges to crab preserving fish embryos, which is slightly different than some of these droplet-based systems. It's a lot larger, as you can see, than compared to you know, a salmon embryo, a uh, human oocyte, which is you know, relatively easy to crab preserve now. Uh, zebrafish embryos are about a thousand times bigger than that. And obviously salmon embryos, which is the fish that everybody likes to consume is a lot larger than that. So the surface area to volume ratio is really, really high. That uh, makes the, the biological transport of CPA and water in and out of the system fairly hard. There are also these multiple compartments, as you guys can see, we have a developing blastoderm, a chorion, uh, we have the yolk um, and all of these, and this also a dynamic system. So as you know, the embryo develops uh, into later developmental stages, you will see these membranes change, thicken, their permeabilities will also change. So there is something here that I'm showing you guys, it's called the yolk syncytial layer, and it develops between the cells and the yolk. And as the cells move around the yolk, and the, the description people use is like a ski cap over you, being pulled over your head, you will see that this yolk syncytial layer will continue to develop and thicken. And this prevents almost any transport of uh, CPA inside the uh, inside the yolk. And that's actually the region where majority uh, ice forms and destruction happens. And so we've been working with different ways. People have been trying to study, you know, how to get CPA inside the yolk. <clears throat> and you can see here that uh, it's very difficult to get uh, CPA inside in very uh, hypotonic solutions. And also, you know, we cannot use, uh, I would say, slow-based freezing because the longer the uh, the exposure to these sub-zero temperatures, the likely damage to happen. So this is a very unique system and it requires maybe a different way of thinking about this. So we've been able to show that you can use micro-injections. So any zebrafish researcher will tell you that micro-injection is fairly used in their lab to do all sorts of transgenic based experiments. Uh, and so we uh, you, you know, use that approach in order to load uh, both uh, cryoprotectants as well as nanoparticles inside and outside in different compartments of the embryo. So you see here, we have two different modes. We could have a single injection where we deliver nanoparticles directly into the yolk and those nanoparticles then get taken up by the cells. We can surround the, the droplet by uh, the embryo by a droplet of gold. And you can also have the ability to inject into the outer compartments as well using the double injection system. And what we try to do is after any treatment, we try to see how the development is hampered by any treatment that we give, whether that's injection of nanoparticles, CPA, whether it's freezing, laser warming, <clears throat> So we able to we we essentially track the development of the zebrafish over five days, and here we in the study we were able to find that you know propylene glycol and methanol, uh, which are fairly common uh, crab protectants for marine systems, are fairly suitable. The peglated gold nanorods uh, that were developed by nanocomposites are fairly biocompatible, and they can be easily spread inside the embryo. And also the developmental factor. Uh, the, the embryo's developmental stage is a huge factor in how the, the nanoparticles spread and get taken up. So we've run some studies with fluorescent nanoparticles, again from nanocomposics, and we were able to show that these uh, nanoparticles can be spread throughout the different compartments of the embryos. However, you know, there's still a big challenge as to how to prevent the leakage of these nanoparticles from the yolk. You know, if you make a hole into any membrane, you know, there is some matter that comes out. So that leads to certain inconsistencies. And using some of the modeling based and uh, property characterization that we've done on these nanoparticles, we'll be able to generate, you know, what are the kind of rates uh, we can get from radiating a zebrafish embryo that contains these nanoparticles. So this is our general methodology. We begin with the micro injection at a high, uh, at the high cell stage. So this is just before the Y cell starts to form so that we can quickly get the nanoparticles into the cell. Then we perform something known as a pre-freezing bath. Essentially what that does is it allows the outer compartments to lose water and maybe gain some CPA. It's a very short exposure to these cryoprotectants. Almost no CPA enters the, the yolk in this case. Then we begin after a certain waiting period to let the embryo heal, we begin our rapid cooling and cryo storage stage. So what we try to do is we put these embryos onto a, a very thin plastic strip, which is called a cryotop, and then we just 
immerse them, plunge freeze them in liquid nitrogen. And what we're trying to see here is, do we actually get vitrification and vitrification or we get cracking? <clears throat> and then those embryos could be stored in any kind of liquid nitrogen dewer and stabilized. And then we essentially could laser nano warm these um, by radiating them under our millisecond laser. And then we perform something known as a post-warming bath to just remove the toxic cryoprotectants from the outer chambers and reinflate its chorea. And then our idea is to essentially develop the, the embryos as long as they can. So the five-day developmental period is pretty crucial to us. Um, most of the embryos are lost during that period. But once they get to day five, we should be able to grow them to sexual maturity and then have them mate with a partner to produce more and more embryos for, let's say, XYZ application, whether that's to regenerate a new line, transgenic line, mutant line of fish, or whether it's for aquaculture purposes. So in this latest paper that we, that we just published, uh, we were able to show that we get pretty consistent survival after both these laser warming, uh, both double injected and laser, uh, single injected modes. And uh, we were also able to show that some of the fish that made it to day five are able to be housed, reach sexual maturity and then spawn effectively. And all the, uh, the children of these laser warmed crab preserved fish are also able to live you know, up to day five without many developmental abnormalities. So, you know, we just talked a little bit about that these aquatic species such as zebrafish, you know, they get huge amounts of funding from the NIH to, you know, study all sorts of disease, whether that's cancer, whether that's embryology, and all of these transgenic lines really require banking. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we are going through a very big mass extinction. Uh, we are losing indigenous species at a very rapid rate. So we need to come up with a way to sustainably bank them. Hopefully someday if we repair those ecosystems, we can reintroduce them. And this has already been done for different kinds of species, whether that's the rhino, whether that's the cheetah, black ferret, uh, the panda. <clears throat> and then I think the biggest thing would be as we have seen that due to climate change, we're losing <clears throat> the ability to grow fish in our oceans. There's also overfishing and many of these coastal economies essentially develop, uh, depend on these uh, fisheries. Um, like think about a country like Phil uh, Philippines, you know, 60% of their protein actually comes from fish. And I would say that, you know, with ocean, you know, acidification, it would be increasingly hard for that kind of population to depend on wild catch production. So aquaculture will have to come in, these countries will have to develop aquaculture. And one thing that we can help them do is the ability to have circ annual aquaculture, essentially grow fish at any time of the year, regardless on what the spawning conditions are. And that can be made possible through cryobanking. Well, thank you very much for uh, giving us the time to present our research. I'd like to thank and recognize all of these different collaborators that we have here. Um, you know, obviously the Zebrafish Corps, the Smithsonian Group, Nanocomposics, for all the grants that we've been able to write with them. CryoSite, our partner that is helping us <clears throat> come into the aquaculture space and also different funders from different agencies. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. That was a, a great presentation. And so I'm just going to uh, start. To, uh, we have a couple questions coming in, um, or that's co come in through the duration of the, of the talk. So um, we'll go ahead and uh, start um, answering them. With uh, yeah, answering them. <laughs> so um, the question um, comes from earlier um, in the presentation um, about the nanomaterials. Um, why are the gold nano rods um, the ones that reach the highest temperature? That's a good question, actually. Uh, we scaled this, and the way you know, I, maybe I should. Can I share my screen again? Uh, the The temperature on the nanoparticles is never more than I would say ten to to twenty degrees, because what happens is these nanoparticles are essentially at the macro scale. Uh, they uh, they are they are thermally uh, relaxed. So what happens is because of the long pulse width, the millisecond pulse width, that gives them enough time to dissipate the heat from themselves. So the nanoparticles never really get overheated. And then um, there was another question um, from, uh, that was referred to on slide, uh, from slide six. Uh, did the nanoparticles act as a nucleation center for cryofreezing? That's a good question. I think uh, we've not really seen that, though I can see why you would think that they are, uh, they could act as, act as nucleators as well. Uh, we have to study that. 
I think definitely more. <clears throat> Um, and this question comes from Nicole. Um, I think it was site uh, 14. What are the concentration of nanoparticles needed per cell uh, volume? Uh, that depends on what kind of system you're in. And again, it will also depend on what kind of nanoparticle you're using. So, you know, let's say we are trying to use some nano shells for some of our droplet based systems. That is a different concentration versus the nano rods that are injected into the, uh, into the zebra fish. That's a different concentration. So I would refer you to the papers. You know, I have, uh, you know, published almost two papers in this on the zebra fish. So if you can, you know, get those papers, you should find what the exact concentrations are. Yeah, Connor, I put that in the chat. I, I put the link in the chat. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then this question comes from um, Joyce. Uh, do the organisms lose the nanoparticles as they grow? And at what stage do they retain the nanoparticles? Yeah, so I've actually done this study. I haven't published on it, but uh, within about seven days, almost all the nanoparticles are cleared out of the system. And one thing we've noticed is uh, the nanoparticles are fairly non-toxic. <clears throat> it's mostly the injury occurs from damaging the, you know, there's the yolk uh, from the injection and also from the crab protectants being injected. The thing is that the yolk is not developing, you know, it's just being consumed as like a small droplet of energy for the cells as they grow and develop. So the cells are only exposed to very short and very low concentrations of CPA throughout their development. And as these um, organisms grow, these membranes also get thicker and more and less and less permeable. So the CPA will not leak out of those membranes also. So uh, the zebrafish uh, embryo is fairly robust to taking these kind of injections of toxic, you know, chemicals, I would say, because we inject what, uh, 30 molars directly in, which, you know, dilutes down because of all the water that's present inside the yolk to about two to three molars. Um, this next question, uh, a few questions that are tied together, uh, but the, um, from Young, Young Park, um, injecting the right uh, power of the incident light is probably important to achieve enough photothermal effects. Uh, I'm wondering whether the photothermal effect uh, is lit literally increases a function of power of the incident light. Huh. Okay, so I, I, you know, I can see why you would think that increasing the power would really help, but I think it's also the absorption scattering, the but you know, the optical photothermal properties of your system as well. So it's both. I would say, you know, finding the correct power that can generate the heat, but also making sure that that heat can be spread uniformly because you know you could have essentially bears you know absorption you can essentially keep losing power as you go from the top of the embryo to the bottom of the embryo so i would say it's both it's developing you know these nanoparticles that can also scatter and absorb heat the right way um, then after warming the samples based on the pho photothermal effect what kinds of methods are used to separate particles from the sample uh, that's a good question. So in the zebrafish, we honestly really don't do anything. As I said, we should do more studies on this. Um, um, and probably we'll, we will probably do it in the, for the next publication. But about seven days it takes, and these particles are naturally passed through their system. Also, I don't, I don't think the nanoparticle, the you know, we're not injecting that many nanoparticles. You know, I think that uh, if you look at it, in a microliter system, it's probably maybe a million nanoparticles are in there. So they should be getting cleared out very quickly. And then I see the final question is, what is the biggest challenge for commercialization of this technology? And that's a very good question. I think that uh, obviously the demand is going to be out there. Uh, if you be talk about just laser-based uh, photonic technology uh, to you know, re, you know, rewarm these samples, I think that each specific fish system or marine system has its own unique challenges. So making it a platform technology is going to you know, have its own problems. And also making sure that we can you know, get these nanoparticles into the hand of experts you know, who are, can also work with these nanoparticles, characterize them, and then also you know, well-versed in cryobiology and also developmental biology of the XYZ system. So I think that would be some of the biggest challenges, I would say. I think there's also some other practical considerations too for commercialization 
related to scale up. And so there's um, certainly a number of interesting materials that have been demonstrated at small scales. And then one of the challenges associated with making nanomaterials is understanding all of those nuances associated with producing it at much larger uh, reaction sizes um, in order to bring down costs and to make sure that you have large batches for, um, for ensuring consistency across multiple patients or um, for a wide variety of, of uses. Um, so I think there's, there's scale up issues that are um, critical to commercialization. Um, it touched briefly on some of the regulatory requirements. Um, so depending on if materials are gonna be used for animals versus human, um, topically versus in vivo, um, there's all sorts of different regulatory requirements that need to be met. And so in addition to just the um, control of the optical properties and the science, then there's also a wide range of engineering and, and regulatory issues that also need to be addressed as part of the commercialization process. Yeah, and I would also like to add, this has actually come up during our ERC uh, meetings. And uh, there's also a big ethical challenge. Um, you know, should we be bringing back, should we be banking some of these species that are going extinct? Should we actually be bringing them back? You know, those are the same challenges with organ banking. Could they be misused by certain amounts of people? Gene editing and gene-based um, uh, models are being cryopreserved here. And do we want them in our food system? As you know, people don't really like to eat GMO-based products. And, you know, so fish farmers also go through huge amounts of stigma, you know, for their products that they generate. So there are also huge ethical concerns also that come up. Yeah, there, there were also, uh, I think uh, Nicole had some questions kind of, and other questions I saw and tried to answer uh, while you were speaking, Kanap. But uh, I think there are questions related to how these nanoparticles clear from these systems. And those are really good questions that uh, haven't been completely answered. And the zebrafish system, Conoff has looked at this pretty in, in detail and he can uh, you know, give you a much more detailed response in, in a moment. But um, we, we basically couldn't measure it with analytical techniques like ICP mass spec, but we, we believe that you know, there probably are some gold nanoparticles left. In the case of those uh, organs that I showed you earlier, uh, we know that some iron oxide remains in the system. So it's actually an interesting overlap with some of the work that's been done in the, uh, uh, the Society of Thermal Medicine where people are using iron oxide to try and treat cancer and they're doing uh, you know, um, <clears throat> interstitial injection and leaving iron in the body. Uh, you, you sort of have similar questions, you know, how much iron is it okay to leave in the body Clearly, if you're dying of cancer and you have some iron in your body, it's probably acceptable. Um, but how much is acceptable to have in an organ that you might be putting back in? Right now, the amounts are below what would be FDA approved for different types of iron that goes into the body. But you know, work is ongoing to uh, answer that in a more clear way. I don't know if you wanted to add to that, kind of with your experience. Yeah. Um... I would say that in the zebrafish, what we do is silver stain histology, and we need to do more studies in order to see that. And also, I think maybe we also need to see how the nanoparticles get distributed into the, as the embryo moves on from day one, which is a very different looking embryo to like a fully grown, not fully grown, but a larval embryo, uh, larval fish, and how, uh, you know, nanoparticles are getting distributed in its vasculature is also, I think, we something we have to work on and figure out. <clears throat> I see another question come up on the zebrafish and it says, it's by Abhishek and it says, do the treatment of nanoparticles affect the basic rest and activity patterns of the zebrafish? And actually they do. Um, what happens, you know, with these, some of these systems is um, you disrupt small things like the temperature at which they are being cultured or the you know, the water salt concentration that's in them. I see that happen a lot with some of our shrimp based systems and that can completely change your experimental, you know, you will get all sorts of varied um, results. You know, you would not be able to get the same kind of viabilities you expect from your system. So we have to be very cognizant of that and make sure that at each specific stage we're measuring, you know, what is 
what's really happening to the embryos. And what we do is, uh, if we see any developmental malformation after every treatment we give them, we remove those embryos and call them not survived, even though they might be an embryo that you know was looking like it's developing, but if it's behind schedule, if it doesn't hatch by day three, those embryos are then removed and then those are considered to be dead embryos essentially in our study. But kind of, can you say for sure, do you, I mean, those, those, some of those effects happen even in the absence of nanoparticles, right? That, that is true. They, as I just said, they can happen if you, you know, don't keep them at 28 sleep or, you know, for, you know, if you, there is disruption by an hour, sometimes, you know, when you're looking at these embryos under the microscope and you forget, you put them on a cold table, that can add hours worth of delay sometimes. So we just have to be cognizant of that. <clears throat> and, but sometimes yeah. there are natural also problems. And this happens more in marine fish. It doesn't happen in such a well-studied aquaculture, uh, sorry, an aquarium fish like zebra fish, but it happens a lot more in marine fish where uh, we've had also in our lab that some of these fish, we make, they make it to day five, but then when we put them in the husbandry um, systems, then they die off. And we still do not know why that happens. So about 80, 90% of the fish will, all, you know, in zebra fish will just make it to this adulthood phase. Whereas in other kinds of systems in shrimp in marine fish, which are, you know, the husbandry has not been developed yet. You may only get 30 to 40%. Uh, in corals, I know only 1% of the corals actually make it to, you know, fully grown uh, coral animal or fragment, I would say, out of the, the larvae that we have. And so that's why we also have to look at, you know, big high throughput work. You know, how do we bank? whole coral reef or billions of larvae if we need to, or tons of different kinds of fragments from these you know, specific samples. And Kanaf, you kind of, uh, again, this is a question I was typing up while you were talking, so maybe you can just answer it too. Like in the zebrafish that did survive, that grew, did you see any evidence you know, they, obviously they procreated and so on, but can you talk about any differences you saw between them and control? Not really. So um, uh, they have the same kind of swim pattern. They have a heartbeat. We have also measured how long they are. Um, and they are very similar, I would say, to controls in that way. Uh, once the fish make it to, I would say, once the fish make it to the hatching stage, I am fairly confident that the fish should make it to day five and should be able to, you know, be put in the husbandry system. So most of the, 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 I would say the, 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 the I would say the error bars mostly happen at, you know, hour one, three, day one, day two. And so, what do you, what, what are the challenges, uh, kind of, to scaling all this up? Uh, we did not discuss it in these slides, but I think to get to a bigger embryo, uh, we have to first off completely redesign maybe the laser uh, pulse. So we may have to come up with a way to split up the laser pulse in order to minimize the, the scattering that happens because all of these uh, fish embryos have large amounts of lipid uh, in its yolk and that lipid is uh, heavily scattering. So in order to get penetration through the yolk, and as you guys just said, the yolk is the biggest site of ice formation. We have to come up with a, maybe a different laser strategy where we split up the beam heat from multiple different sides so that you know we can still get enough penetration and warming throughout the embryo. So it's uniform warming that's occurring. And this work will probably happen under the ERC with our collaborators at you know UC Riverside. And I think we'll have time for, um, for one more question. This was a... Uh... Do the treatment uh, with the nanoparticles affect basic rest activity and patterns of zebra fish? Uh, do you observe any behavior uh, in the developed fish? Yeah, so um, I, I think I answered this question and yes, we do see that happen, uh, not just from the treatments we give them, but also from basic things that are, you know, maybe sometimes not under control, just noise into our samples, whereas, that could be, you know, not using the right amount of salt concentration in their media. If that's off, um, you know, osmolality is a big thing as well in these embryos, specifically at the earlier stage. So if the salt concentration is slightly off, that can really, you know, completely mess up your system. And we also see there are natural uh, things that also happen. We've seen a seasonality in some of these fish. Um, so sometimes in the spring and even in winter time, we don't get the best quality embryos. And that's a very difficult question to answer because sometimes there is lack of fertilization success 
or just embryos don't make it to a particular developmental stage. So there is a lot of variability that can happen. And in the zebrafish, we usually see that variability between day one and day three, and not necessarily after um, the hatch period, which is after day three, I would say. But in marine systems, which is also systems we want to work on, and some of them are we working on, we see variability all throughout the, the developmental cycle. Wonderful. I think personally learn, learned a lot myself, probably have uh, plenty more questions uh, to, to carry us through. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll wrap up um, our, our discussion today. Thank you um, all to all of our panelists so much um, for sharing uh, your research and the involvement um, that you've had on, on the different projects that we've discussed today. Um, so we'll thank everybody for their attendance today and uh, Appreciate you joining in with us and um, thank you. Have a wonderful uh, afternoon or, or uh, morning. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.